Good evening and welcome. So on midnight, August 14th, 1947, most of you will be familiar with what I'm about to say. Prime Minister of Independent India made his most famous, or perhaps his second most famous speech. Long years ago, he said, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. I'll return to that tryst in a minute, but that was August 14th, 1947. A little over a month later, Gandhi returned to Delhi from Calcutta. India and Pakistan, these two independent nations, were a month old. The city, Delhi, was in the grip of what historians call communal riots. And his own quarters were packed with refugees. And he went to the last place he would live, Birla House. There he lived in a ground floor room. His weight was 113 pounds. He was frail. But a Delhi Muslim likened his arrival in Delhi, and this is pertinent because it's Delhi, the Great Plains, likened his arrival to the arrival of the rains after a long and harsh summer. In November, he went to address a meeting of six at the Shish Ganj Gurdwara. And he saw not a single Muslim on the road to Chandni Chok. And he wrote, what could be more shameful for us than the fact that not a single Muslim could be found in Chandni Chok? I have no answer, he continued in his writings, I have no answer to return to the Muslim friends who see me from day to day as to what they should do. And Gandhi being Gandhi, he embarked on his last fast. Yes. This time he gave no warning, unlike his other fast. He simply embarked on his fast, and he claimed he would only stop when the capital proved its change of heart and made amends to the Muslims. And the fast worked something like a miracle. The demand for continued partitions stopped. The demand to drive out the Muslims <coughs> from Delhi stopped. Many Muslims were able to return to their homes and neighborhoods, and perhaps for the first time since 1946, the people of Delhi began to resume the business of daily life. On the fifth day of his fast, 100,000 government employees signed a pledge promising to work for peace, and so did the police. And almost at once, the politics of his fast had devastating consequences. An officer of the Hindu Mahasabha showed his disapproval by publicly repudiating this pledge. Gandhi was undeterred. He was carried out on the 19th of January, 1948, to a prayer meeting. At the time, he was planning his mission to Pakistan and drawing up a political testament. On the 30th of January, we know this date, it's iconic, Peace Janbari Marg, yes? on the 30th of January, 1948, he met Margaret Bork White, the photojournalist who took the last photograph of him before his death. For those of you who only take photographs on your cell phones, she was an actual photographer. <laughs> it was an actual camera, okay. And she asked him about the atom bomb. Gandhi had already written of the moral danger in making the atom bomb. If an aircraft drops a bomb on a city, she said, what should the followers of Ahimsa do? And Gandhi replied in what to those of us who have studied him for years seemed like a characteristically double negative response. He said, well, if the bomb is actually falling, ahimsa is the one thing it cannot destroy. The followers should not run, nor should they hide. They should stand in the thousands looking up, watching without fear. And always with Gandhi, there was this clincher. And they should be praying for the pilot, he said. So I started by saying there were two famous speeches Nehru made. The second one that he made, of course, was after Gandhi was assassinated. He rushed to Birla House, he knelt near Gandhi's body, and he sobbed. Nehru sobbed. Why is that important? For those of you who've read Nehru's autobiography, he's remarkably constrained, restrained even, about emotional things. So you would read passages about when his own wife died, and you don't hear or you don't read a great deal of affective sentiment. But here he sobbed. In his public address on the radio, he said, the light has gone out of our lives. There is darkness everywhere. I do not know quite what to tell you and how to say it. Our beloved leader, Bahu, as we used to call him, the father of our nation, is no more. Fifty-some years later, the tryst of which he spoke 
also seems to be no more. Today, right-wing groups turn a blind eye when Muslims are beaten to death on suspicion of eating beef. The BJP hosts mandatory yoga sessions for its ministers. And many demand that only a true Hindu civilizational history be taught in schools and universities. Some Hindu fundamentalists have issued calls to expel all Muslims from India. How did this happen? How did this ideology capture the general will of the same population that a little over 50 years ago threw its weight behind Gandhi and Nehru, both of whom committed to an inclusive India? Our guest today, we hope, will have some answers to this question. It is my very great pleasure to introduce all of you to Professor Rajmohan Gandhi. He's a professor, he's a biographer, most importantly, following in the lines of his grandfather, he's interested in peace and reconciliation. His father, Devdas Gandhi, was the editor of the Hindustan Times from 1935 to 1957. Professor Gandhi, Professor Rajmohan Gandhi's newest publication, was last year in December 2018, is called Modern South India, South India, a history from the 17th century to our times. He's been a research professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a visiting professor at Michigan State, the IIT Bombay, IIT Gandhinagar. He's also served as president of contemporary history at the 78th session of the Indian History Congress, held in Calcutta. Relevant for us today is a book by him entitled Why Gandhi Still Matters, an appraisal of the Mahatma's legacy, and a previous book called Mohandas, a true story of a man, his people, and an empire, which received the biennial award from the Indian History Congress in 2007. And which was published in the University of California by Which was published by the University of California Press. It's wonderful to introduce somebody who helps me out with the award. <laughs> he has served as a member of the Rajya Sabha, <coughs> resident editor of the Indian Express in Chennai, chief editor of something called Himmat in Mumbai. And Himmat, which is courage, has a subtitle. It says, A Space for What Must Be Said. And I urge all of you to go on that website. Professor Gandhi is not only the editor, he is one of the chief contributors, but there are others as well. And on that website, it's certainly clear that what must be said is said on it. He's been associated with initiatives of change, formerly known as moral rearmament. He will speak to us today on Hindu nationalism in Gandhi's India. Our hope is that we can continue to call it Gandhi's India. But before I turn the podium over to him, I would like to thank our sponsors. And our sponsors for this event are Hindus for Human Rights, the Indian American Muslim Council, the Center for British Studies on campus, the Center for Race and Gender on campus, and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Professor Gandhi's talk will be followed by a discussion, which in the interests of making it easy for him, I will moderate simply because I know more of you. And all of you are invited to continue the conversation afterwards at a reception in the room outside. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Rajmohan Gandhi. I'm sure of one thing, having heard uh, Professor Bhatia's speech just now for the first time, and suspecting that she probably has made introductions previously also, that with such an eloquent introducer, you don't need the main speaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm sure many of you, certainly I would have liked to hear her uh, continue. But then, <laughs> there we are. Um, this is, I've, in my <coughs> long life, I've been to many campuses, I've been lucky enough, uh, but this is the very first time I'm speaking to a uh, group of Berkeley students and faculty, so I'm very, very honored. So before life comes to a stop, at least I have, can say that I've been to Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite know whether I will provide the answers that uh, it was said I would provide, uh, but I will speak more or less on, on four points today. First, very short context for Hindu nationalism. 
Secondly, the difference between Hindu nationalism and Gandhi's idea of Hinduism. Uh, and then more of what is happening in India today, although you are aware of what is happening. And finally, very uh, short suggestions on what can be done. So, um, from the end of World War II, roughly, until recent years, many in the world across national, religious, or ethnic divides shared a common dream. Uh, that dream included equality for all, dignity for all, protection of all, mutual respect, mutual friendship. It was a dream to be achieved through democratic participation, the rule of law, and where necessary through nonviolent struggle. Actualized nowhere <coughs> fully, that dream was celebrated everywhere. In recent years, an alternative vision has questioned and in many places replaced that dream. This alternative vision seems to take pleasure and pride in hierarchy, domination, money power, gun power, coarse language. It elevates hate over friendship, supremacy over equality, double speak over honesty, and guns over lives. This vision has champions and in many eyes heroes. In several countries, it has won elections, installed governments, and replaced constitutions. When not many days back at the Houston event called Howdy Modi, mm -hmm. where Modi in effect endorsed Trump for 2020, and Trump suggested that Modi was the father of India, mm -hmm. we saw the mutual adoration of ethno nationalists. It is not hard to imagine a larger jamboree somewhere where these two are joined by Putin, Xi Jinping, Turkey Erdogan, Brazil's <coughs> Bolsonaro, Hungary's Orban. Britain's Boris, <laughs> and others, not everyone sharing all the same views, but all of them praising one another and receiving standing ovations. One of India's sharpest cartoonists is E.P. Unni, who draws for the Indian Express, the national newspaper, as you know, published from multiple cities. 19 years ago, on December 12, 2000, the Indian Express carried an Unni cartoon showing K.S. Sudarshan, then the chief of the RSS, as a school teacher. In this cartoon, before Sudarshan, squatting on the floor, sits the only pupil in the class, holding a slate in his hands and wearing a school uniform of a shirt and shorts. The pupil is Atal Bihari Vajpayee, then India's Grand Prime Minister. This is what the cartoon says. Tell me, Sudarshan ji, schoolboy Vajpayee asks the eminent teacher, what happened when Godse ji went to the prayer meeting to protect Gandhiji. <laughs> Four years after the cartoon appeared, Shekhar Gupta, then the chief editor of Indian Express, was invited to dinner by Sudarshan, the RSS chief, who told him that while Godse had indeed gone with the pistol to Gandhi's prayer meeting, he had not pulled the trigger. Someone else had killed Gandhi, said Sudarshan, adding ominously, that the man benefiting from the assassination was Jawaharlal Nehru, Gandhi's close colleague in India's first prime minister. Now, as Bob Dylan wrote, the times they are changing. <laughs> They've changed some more after Uni drew this cartoon, and after Gupta told the Sudarshan story in 2012. Gupta has written this in Indian Express. This is before the BJP came to power in 14. In some eyes, Godse no longer needs exculpation. He deserves praise. In May this year, two statements, many of you know this, were made by a woman called Pragya Thakur, mm -hmm. an activist for Hindu nationalism, BJP candidate for the Lok Sabha, and one charged with serious crimes, including an, alle an alleged terror attack. In one statement, Thakur said that Godse was, a, is, and will always remain a patriot. In the other statement, she said she was proud that in 1992, 27 years previously, she had climbed on top of a dome of the Babri Masjid and joined in demolishing the mosque. Along with most BJP candidates, Thakur won the election to parliament with a large majority. Now, the times are changing, but denouncing Gandhi seems risky still. Double speak is safer. So here allow me to uh, read uh, a poem in Hindi Urdu, written by Hussein Hyderi. Some of you may have come across this. 
I will translate it also, not my translation, somebody else's translation. Of course, I'll read it in Hindi. Khaki Rang Divarum Par Latakti Gandhi Ji Ki Badi Si Photo Ke Pishay Se Dupahari Me Ek Lambi Bhuri Si Chip Kali Nikalti Reng Kar Khamoshi Se Ird Gird Photo Ke Gasht Ye Lagati Hai Or Jaisi Hi Koi Keet Padanga Ur Kar Paas Se Guzarta Hai धर दबोच लेती है, पंख नोच देती है, मांस चबा जाती है, जिंदा नगल जाती, जिंदा निगल जाती है, फिर बड़े सलीके से, जैसे कुछ हुआ न हो, कोई भी मरा न हो, रेंग की हुई वापस गांधीजी की फोटो के पीछे लौट जाती। हुसैन हैदरी एंड हेयर इज़ द ट्रांसलेशन बाय ज्योति बचाने हु इज़ हेयर। हेयर and she translates Shipkali, I think quite astutely here, as chameleon. Khaki colored wall with a large photo of Gandhiji from behind which at midday a large brown chameleon crawls out. Quietly surveys here and there near the photo for any moth or mosquito flying by to snap off its head, peel off its wings, devour its flesh, swallow it alive. Then smartly, as if nothing has happened, no one has died, it sneaks back behind the picture of Gandhiji. <laughs> uh, Hindu nationalism owes a good deal to the revolutionary and poet from Maharashtra and somebody that Sanki Bakhle has studied and spoken about, Vinayak Ramudar Savarkar, who engaged in violent activities against British rule and spent many years in prison, but later offered assurances to the empire and was released. Thereafter, he identified Muslims as the Hindu's chief enemy. <coughs> in 1937, Savarka declared, well before Jinnah made a similar statement, that Hindus and Muslims <coughs> were two nations. Following Savarkar's lead, Hindu nationalist literature defines good Indians as those to whom India is both homeland and holy land, a criterion that makes India's Muslims and Christians unpatriotic by definition. In the US, this definition makes Indian Americans unpatriotic. <laughs> it also makes America's Jews, America's Muslims, America's Sikhs, and Christians unpatriotic. By Savarkar's logic, the only Native Americans can be patriotic in the USA. Now, Hindu nationalism's ideological and cultural arm, we all know, is the RSS founded in 1925 by K.B. Hedgewar, steered from 40 to 73 by Golwalkar, currently led by Mohan Bhagwat. Savarkar, Hedgewar, Golwalkar were all Brahmins, as is Bhagwat. <coughs> but in recent decades, this is important to note, the RSS has recruited Hindus from all castes, even if leadership remains largely Brahmin and almost wholly male. The RSS is one of the world's most powerful organizations today. Its cadre is successfully placed in India's central, state, and local governments, India's bureaucracy, universities, the media, and other institutions. Affiliated bodies take the RSS's ideology to youth, to students, women, trade unions, Dalits, Adivasis, merchants associations, farmers associations, and people of Indian origin across the world. The BJP, the political party running India from 2014, proudly acknowledges its relationship to the RSS, Prime Minister Modi was an RSS activist before emerging as a political leader. This is true of many, if not most, BJP politicians. The attempt to fuse religion with nation is nowhere franker than in Goldworker's book, Bunch of Thoughts. <coughs> of India's Muslims and Christians, he says, they are born in this land, Muslims and Christians in India, they are born in this land, no doubt. But are they true its salt? Are they true to its salt? Are they grateful to this land? No. In Golwalkar's words, quote, the Hindu people is the Almighty manifesting himself. The Hindu people is our God, says Golwalkar. The extent to which Hindu first champions, Hindu nationalism champions, go to make Indian synonymous with Hindu came across <coughs> in a 1994 publication authored by B.N. Jog, entitled Threat of Islam in India's dimen Indian Dimensions, complaining that the Indian National Congress, <coughs> the body that led the struggle for Indian independence, and ruled free India almost continuously thereafter, 
according to Job, INC propagated from 1885 the new doctrine, the new doctrine that Muslims are nationals of this country. Job went on to claim that in Spain, converted Muslims were given the option either to return to their orig original fold of Christianity or death or expulsion from <coughs> Spain. This is the way they found most appropriate to deal with Islam. By contrast, lamented Job, in India, nobody even thought on the lines of Spain. The resultant effect is there for everyone to see. Hindus never thought of bringing back converted Muslims to their original Hindu fold. This serious lacuna resulted in keeping alive Islam." Unquote. In 1992 December, Job was buoyed by the demolition of the Babri Mosque. Following the demolition, Job hoped, quote, that the majority of India's Muslims will, will be prevailed upon to return to their original fold. <coughs> so original fold. Assuming even that all the Muslims today are descendants of converts. Assume. Some of these conversions must have occurred hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Their return to the original fold is the only sure way to put an effective end to the suffering of Hindus. By his thinking, Muslims must become Hindus if they want acceptance as Indians. Christians, followers of another foreign religion, must do likewise. Of course, people like uh, him are annoyed that 2.5% of Indians are Christians. In India's northeastern states, however, which lie next not only to China and Myanmar, but also to Bangladesh, and where Christianity is a strong presence, Hindu nationalists have made tactical alliances with Christian politicians especially in the states of Nagaland, Mizoram, and Meghalaya, by portraying the region's Muslims as a danger to everyone. These electoral alliances have made no difference to Hindu nationalist hostility towards Christian schools and colleges across India, including in the northeastern states. Article 30 of the Indian Constitution, which grants the right to religious and linguistic minorities to form and run educational institutions, has for years been an eyesore for the RSS. We should expect uh, before long a, a, an amendment of Article 30. Until the 1980s, studies on Hinduism often ended with Gandhi, with the nonviolent struggles he led for India's independence, his reinvigoration of Hinduism's nonviolent strands, and also of India's age old pluralism. Recent studies, of course, all close with the rise and, in some cases, the triumph of Hindu nationalism. Gandhi's vision for India and his Hinduism clashed fundamentally with Hindu nationalism. Nonviolence, forgiveness, equality, which Gandhi located firmly in the Hindu tradition, were at odds with the advocacy of Hindu primacy. Hindu extremists made several attempts on Gandhi's life before the final and successful one on 30 January 1948. The penultimate bid was made on 20th January by a group that included the men who were to succeed later. Armed with hidden revolvers and explosives and a plan to eliminate him, seven men arrived <coughs> at his prayer meeting in the garden of Birla House, where he was staying. An explosive was set off at one end of the garden, but the rest of the plan miscarried. Solochna Devi, a very poor woman, bravely shouted at Madan Lal Pahwa, who had set off the explosive. Madan Lal was apprehended by others and handed to the police. The others, including Godse, slipped away in a waiting taxi. Madan Lal told the police that God wanted him to destroy Gandhi, who was Hinduism's enemy. According to the previously quoted B.M. Job, Gandhi's flaw was that he wanted Hindus, in Job's words, quote, to treat Muslims as brothers, unquote. 24 hours after the failed attempt on his life, Gandhi made remarks that convey the nature of his Hinduism. These remarks were made at the end of his prayer meeting and were broadcast over the radio to everybody. By this time, his lieutenant Patel was the broadcasting minister, also the home minister. So Gandhi, what Gandhi was saying was broadcast to the nation. You should not have any kind of hate, said Gandhi, against Madan Lal. He had taken it for granted that I am an enemy of Hinduism. Is it not said in chapter 4 of the Gita? that whenever the wicked become too powerful and harm dharma, 
God sent someone to destroy them? The man who exploded the bomb obviously thinks that he has been sent by God to destroy me. Then Gandhi continues, but if we do not like a man, does it mean that he is wicked? If someone kills me, taking me for a wicked man, will he not have to answer before God? When he says he was doing the bidding of God, he is only making God an accomplice in a wicked deed. Those who are behind him, or whose tool he is, should know that this sort of thing will not save Hinduism. If Hinduism is to be saved, it will be saved through such work as I am doing. I have been imbibing Hindu dharma right from my childhood. Do you want to annihilate Hindu dharma by killing a devout Hindu like me? Continues Gandhi, some Sikhs came to me and asked if I suspected that a Sikh was implicated. I know he was not a Sikh, because he knew that Madan Lal had been arrested. But what even if he was? What does it matter if he was a Hindu or a Muslim? May God bless him with good sense. Nine days after saying this, Gandhi was killed. Now much earlier when he was 40, this is what Gandhi had written in Hind Swaraj. India cannot cease to be one nation because people belonging to different religions live in it. In reality, there are as many religions as there are individuals, but those who are conscious of the spirit of nationality do not interfere with one another's religion. In no part of the world, he continues, are one nationality and one religion synonymous terms, nor has it ever been so in India. Is the God of the Muslim different from the God of the Hindu? There are deadly proverbs as between the followers of Shiva and those of Vishnu, yet nobody suggests that the two do not belong to the same nation. Those who do not wish to misunderstand things may read up the Quran, and they will find therein hundreds of passages acceptable to the Hindus. And the Bhagavad Gita contains passages to which not a Muslim can take exception. Am I to dislike a Muslim because there are passages in the Quran I do not understand or like? Unquote. Another core view of Gandhi's was about the Almighty. Human beings called God by different names. God, Jehovah, Ishwar, Allah, Khuda, Ekonkar, Ram, Rahim, Kareem, Krishna, something else. But all Gandhi thought were addressing the same supreme being. As the line sung by him and by millions of Indians put it, Ishwar Allah Erena. Though composed long before his times, the line became synonymous with Gandhi. In April 2000, when I was in Bangladesh, I went to Noakhali, where Gandhi had been 54 years earlier. I asked villagers in Noakhali what they knew about Gandhi, and more than one of them, when I asked them the question on the street, responded by singing Ishwar Allah Terena. The Rama whom I adore, Gandhi explained in one of the Noakhali villages, Sadurkhil, as he had done elsewhere, the Rama whom I adore is God himself, different from any historical Rama. Gandhi's words. He always was is now and will be forever a God who was unborn and uncreated. Gandhi turned to religion to cope with life's sorrows and shocks, not to find a political rallying cry. In the midst of death, he wrote in 1928, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. Gandhi thought that his India for all was crucial to humanity as a whole. On 12th January 48, when, as <coughs> was mentioned, wounded by malice in the subcontinent, he fasted and prayed for the regaining of India's dwindling prestige, say his words. He said, I flatter myself with the belief that the loss of our soul by India will mean the loss of the hope of the aching, storm-tossed, and hungry world. We should observe that the discourse of Hindu nationalists, written discourse, spoken discourse, seldom includes any prayer to the Almighty. For them, Mother India, to be more specific, a map of Mother India, is the source of strength, the reason for sacrifice, 
than the object of worship. They see Mother India as the hapless victim of Muslim and Christian aggression. For Gandhi, God was the source of strength, solace, perspective. While India was a land for everyone, a land served and built by everyone, including by Muslims and Christians, and also a nation with a purpose. In 1947, as Hindu-Muslim violence besmirched the dawn, in India and elsewhere, in India and Pakistan, Gandhi fought for sanity. In the heated climate of 1946-48, his daily prayer meetings, which, as I mentioned, were broadcast to the nation, and which were open to everyone and where verses from different faiths were recited, these became essential classes in democracy and tolerance. Occasionally in Delhi, there were objections to the reading of lines from the Quran. At times in Noah Khali, in now in Bangladesh, Muslims walked out when lines about Rama were chanted. Most of the time, however, Hindus and Muslims joined these multi-faith events, which helped reverse the tide of polarization. The four-word line, Ishwar Allah Tere Naam, and two paired phrases, Ram Rahim and Krishna Kareem, became well-known sounds that served to heal a wounded subcontinent. I think it is impossible to separate Gandhi, the public campaigner, from the inner Mohandas. We cannot separate Gandhi, the leader of millions, from the personal Gandhi who prayed, often from a position of helplessness, from, for strength and wisdom from God. After partition was accepted in the summer of 47, Gandhi challenged Jinnah. Man was successfully led the demand for Pakistan. Quote, to build a Pakistan where the Gita could be recited side by side with the Quran, where the temple and the Gurdwara would be given the same respect as the mosque, so that those who had been opposing Pakistan till now would be sorry for their mistake and would only sing praises of Pakistan. Six days later, he said, I ask whether those calling God Rahim would have to leave India, whether in Pakistan Rama as the name of God would be forbidden, would someone who called God Krishna be turned out of Pakistan? Whatever be the case there, we shall worship God both as Krishna and Kareem and show the world that we refuse to go mad. In 47, the last year of his life, his interventions at crucial critical meetings of the Indian National Congress ensured that Free India would be launched politically and constitutionally as a nation for everyone and with equal protection for all. Pakistan, formed as a Muslim homeland, was echoing with demands to be declared an Islamic state. Many in India responded with cries for a Hindu counterpart. India's capital city, Delhi, teemed with hundreds of thousands of Sikh and Hindu refugees from Western Punjab. Newly free India could easily have been launched as a Hindu state. That did not happen. Gandhi's focused effort, backed by Nehru and backed by Deputy Prime Minister Patel, laid the foundation for a secular India with room in it for people of any or no faith. From today's vantage point, this feat appears to be every bit as remarkable as independence from alien rule. Soon it was entrenched in the constitution the Dr. Bhimra Ambedkar, son of so-called untouchables, would architect. Gandhi enlisted large sections of the Indian people in his bid, no constitutional provision of equal rights could have worked in India without millions of Indians admitting in their hearts <coughs> the truth of Ishwar Allah Tere Naam. No truth, no thought was simpler or so aligned to common sense or to the psyche of the Indian people and yet so radical as Ishwar Allah Tere Naam. Despite the poisonous wind of 1947, the people of India chose the path of sanity and common sense and walked on it for more than 65 years. It's a different story now. Some in today's India say that, that a second generation Indian American should of course be running for the US presidency, yet in India, Muslims whose forebears may have arrived a thousand years ago must prove their loyalty to the Indian state before they can be allowed to vote. In the election campaign of April, May this year, Giriraj Singh, a union minister and BJP candidate from Begu Sarai in Bihar, referred to the popular cry Vande Mataram which Hindu nationalists often demand that Muslims raise as proof of their loyalty to India. Pointing out <coughs> that as Hindu, <coughs> that as Hindus, his deceased relatives were cremated, they did not need graves, Giridat Singh re reminded Muslims, you will need three arm lengths for your burial. And he added, those who cannot say Vande Matram, the nation will never forgive them. 
After his and his party's large electoral victory, Giriraj Singh was promoted to full cabinet rank. It was one of several indications that a democratic India that treats all as equal citizens is disappearing before our eyes. Now, on August 14, two months, less than two months back, two groups of men waited in sweltering heat the whole day for a court of the additional district judge of Alwar in the state of Rajasthan to announce its verdict in the case involving the lynching of dairy farmer Pehlu Khan on April 1, 2017. <coughs> One group was that of the men accused of the killing and their associates. The other group were supporters of the dead man, elders from the village. Close to, sundown, close to sundown, word came that the judge had acquitted all the men accused. The burst of triumphalist sloganeering of the accused men and their supporters was matched only by the despair of the family and neighbors of Pehlu Khan. Jabuna Begum, Khan's widow, said she was heartbroken. Yushad Khan, his oldest son, said, we have lost faith in the law. For two and a half years, we have been waiting. We thought that justice would be delivered and it would give peace to my father's soul. Our hopes were shattered. Now, this is, I'm, some of this is quoted from Harsh Mandar, this remarkable man who was the senior IS officer who resigned after the 2002 killings in Gujarat. He writes, this was an acquittal foretold. From the day of the attack, the police did everything they could to subvert the possibility of any punishment of the men who planned or executed before video cameras the public lynching of Pehlu Khan. Pehlu Khan had listed six men in a statement in the hospital before he died. Six, five months later, police removed the names of all these six men from the list of the accused. Two videos had been taken of the crime. The police did not send the video for forensic verification of its authenticity. <coughs> Citing the absence of verification, the court rejected the videos as evidence. Months after the lynching, NDTV repo reporters captured on secret camera the main accused, Vipin Yadav, bragging, we kept beating Pehlu Khan up for one and a half hours. First there were ten people, then the crowd swelled. But this video was not presented by the police to the court. The case was designed to fall apart. <coughs> Moreover, a month before the acquittal, Pehlu Khan's sons and nephews were charged sheeted under the Rajasthan Bovine Animal Act for transporting milch animals across state borders without required documents. In fact, they had not crossed any state border when they were attacked. As Harshmandra puts it, the rules of crime and punishment are being rewritten in an India rapidly remolded as a Hindu nation. By these new rules, if anyone is lynched for alleg allegedly harming the cow, <coughs> the persons lynched are the original sinners. <coughs> After all, they sought to <coughs> injure or kill the cow, sacred to Hindus. The lynch mob are the victims. They were provoked by the alleged cow killers. Their violence is righteous and heroic. The cow killing communities, as they are labeled, are the enemies. The lynch mobs are the soldiers of the Hindu nation. In dozens of well publicized trials in the last two years, the accused have all been acquitted, while surviving victims and relatives of killed victims are pursued by the police and by mobs for violating bans against cow slaughter or other laws. Sudha, Sudha Bharadvaj, I imagine some of you have heard of her, was born an American citizen to Konkani Brahmin parents Krishna and Raghunath Bharadvaj who were pursuing their PhDs at MIT. Bharadvaj returned to India at the age of 11. She gave up her US citizenship at the age of 18, joined IIT Kanpur to study mathematics, completed in <coughs> five years of course, exposed while an IIT student to horrific working conditions of laborers in UP West Bengal, Bihar, while she was a student at IIT, she moved to work with Shankar Guha Niyogi's remarkable Ch Chhattisgarh Mukti Morcha in 1986. In the year 2000, she got a law degree. While with the Mukti Morcha, she fought against corrupt bureaucrats to ensure that legal <coughs> wages were paid to workers in the mines and plants located in Bhilai in Bihar. She also worked for Dalit and tribal rights to land, education, health and security against hostile landlords. She became a visiting professor at the National Law University in Delhi. 13 months ago, in September of 2018, Sudha Bharadvaj accused, along with five others, of wanting to initiate a Maoist attack, was arrested in the city of Pune. 
In September of this year, the year after the arrest, she told the Bombay High Court, through a lawyer, that she had been in jail for one whole year and the Pune police had failed to produce any credible evidence against her. Her lawyer told the High Court judge that the police had relied on six documents, most of them typed letters and some of them naming her to build their case against her. None of the letters was written by her or addressed to her or even found in her possession. Sudha Bharadwaj and the others arrested with her remain in prison without being brought to trial. Then there is Justice Akhil Abdul Hamid Qureshi. For some time, he has been the senior most judge in the Gujarat High Court. In 2010, as a High Court judge, he had sent Amit Shah, the BJP's national president from 2014, to police custody in the Swarabuddin fake encounter case. In May of this year, the Collegium of India Supreme Court recommended that Qureshi be appointed Chief Justice of the Madhya Pradesh High Court, High Court of a very large state. Some months later, after receiving two notes from the government, the Supreme Court then decided to send Qureshi as Chief Justice of the Tripura High Court, which is a much smaller court in northeast in India, instead of the, to the Madhya Pradesh Court as it had already decided. On September 21, Justice Qureshi resigned from the judicial service. It's just some examples of what's happening. Now, Kashmir, I will say a word or two about that, too. Uh, on August 9th, four days after the Article 370 was, in effect, abrogated, uh, a congressman representing a Long Island constituency on the edge of New York City, a man called Tom Swozy. Uh, on August 9, he had written a letter to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo expressing anxiety that India's scrapping of Article 370, quote, risks provoking mass social unrest, unquote, in Kashmir. Agitated over the letter, Indian Americans who had played roles in Swozy's election and fundraising flooded the office of the congressman with angry messages. <coughs> On August 11, which was a Sunday, Swazi met with 100 Indian Americans and issued an apology. Quote, based upon my meeting, said Swazi, it is clear that it is a mistake to not consult with some of my Indian American friends and supporters before I sent my letter to Pompeo, unquote. If not consulting, constituents before writing a letter calls for an apology. What would you say about not consulting any representatives of a population of millions before their territory is, quote, fully amalgamated, unquote, by a much larger power? Article 370 was a fig leaf, undoubtedly, but it was an important fig leaf. In many eyes, it validated, legitimized India's suzerainty over Kashmir. Now, without it, Kashmiris only see India forcibly occupying their land through probably half a million soldiers in a Kashmir valley holding seven or eight million people. The Indian government does not give any figure about how many soldiers there are in Kashmir. But Kashmir provides perhaps the greatest soldier to civilian ratio in the entire world. Curfews, total bans on meetings, even on any discussion of quote unquote recent events, on pain of imprisonment and heavy fine. This is the reality today in Kashmir. It has been silenced from August 5. Just two days ago, or a day ago, I think. Ram Madhav, the BJP leader, who was sort of in charge of the Kashmir policy of the BJP government. He went to Kashmir and addressed a BJP meeting. No other meetings are allowed, of course. No, no one can, no group can meet to discuss anything or say anything, write anything. Uh, uh, several thousand have been arrested, but this BJP meeting was allowed, and Ram Madhav spoke at it. This is what he said. Anyone who creates hurdles on the path of peace and development will be dealt with sternly. There are many jails in India for these. Everyone is afraid of Modi ji. Unquote. This is Ram Madhav 
in Sri Lanka. Um, then there is the National Register for Citizens. Uh, as you know of this, this is being done in Assam, in North in India at the moment. Uh, but this is an All India goal uh, <coughs> to compel all Muslims across India to prove that they are genuinely Indian citizens and they're not infiltrated from Bangladesh or Myanmar or any other country. Every Muslim, 180 million Muslims across India. Not yet official policy, but a declared goal that everybody will have to prove that through documents that their grandparents, parents, were Indian citizens. The National Register for Citizens in Assam has shown that there are 1.9 million people uh, who have not been able to prove that they are citizens. Uh, many of them are Hindus, Bengali-speaking Hindus. Many of them are Muslims. The plan of extending this <coughs> National Register of Citizens across India has these goals. De detect so-called infiltrators, delete <laughs> their names from electoral rolls, deport them, and detain them. There's also the Citizenship Amendment Law, which is not yet law, but has been introduced, which says that if you're a refugee in India from Pakistan or Bangladesh or Myanmar or any other neighboring country, if you're a Sikh, if you're a Christian, uh, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Buddhist, if you're a Jain, you may qualify for citizenship, not if you're a Muslim. Many people think that this is so blatantly uh, against the Constitution that this would not be accepted by the courts. But uh, going by our understanding of how the court is, has conducted itself in the last several months, it's, it's uh, not at all clear that the courts will decide clearly whether it is in Kashmir. The court has refused to even discuss the Kashmir cases before it. It has said that no, we will not discuss it now, later, later, later. Uh, court is uh, about to pronounce in the next two weeks or so on Ayodhya. <laughs> and then if the Citizenship Amendment Law comes before it, uh, we don't know what the court will say. Rather, we fear what the court may say. Now, <coughs> when toxicity hit the subcontinent in 1947, Gandhi, Nehru, and Patel intervened with clear and firm voices India limped back to sanity and began what became an impressive march. Today, when mobs coerce and officers, officers of the state side with the coercers, Prime Minister Narendra Modi remains silent. Some of you will remember the John McCain moment of October 2008. When he corrected an admirer who said something false about Obama, his rival for the US presidency. That sort of moment is rare in today's America and today's India, although moments that need correction seem to confront us every five minutes. The men and women of India, as I see them on India's streets, they're not bad or hate-filled people. Yes, they are excited by rumor or by anger. They're apt to join a crowd, at times even to join a violent crowd. But they heed a firm functionary of the state, and functionaries usually heed the line drawn by a respected or admired leader. Narendra Modi is an admired leader in today's India, greatly admired by many people. His silence before intimidation, cruelty, and lynching is perhaps the most troubling fact on the Indian stage. Now, you won't get that impression if you read Modi's article published on the second of this month in the New York Times, the article concluded with these lines, quote, 
Let us work shoulder to shoulder to make our world prosperous and free from hate, violence and suffering. That is when we will fulfill Mahatma Gandhi's dream, summed up in his favorite hymn, Vaishnava Jana, which says that a true human is one who feels the pain of others, removes misery, and is never arrogant. The world bows to you, beloved Bapu. That is how he ended his article. Some days after this New York Times article was published, Mr. Modi, who was electioneering in Maharashtra, indicated, more or less announced that India's highest honor, the Bharat Ratna, would be posthumously awarded to Sabha. Now, Dhananjay Kir's admiring biography of Savarkar was first published in 1950, when Savarkar was still alive. In that book, Kir refers to Godse, calling him, quote, a staunch Savarkarite, and known as the vanguard and lieutenant of Savarkar, unquote. <coughs> Five months before Gandhi's assassination in August 47, Godse and one of his accomplices, Apte, had flown with Savarkar from Bombay to Delhi and back. And in January 48, the month when Gandhi was killed, Godse and Apte had two meetings with Savarkar. On January 30, when Godse stepped up within three or four feet of Gandhi, who with his arms resting on Abha and Manu was walking to his prayer, prayer platform, Godse bowed a little before he pulled out his pistol and fired it. Accused of a role in the Gandhi assassination, Savarkar was acquitted for want of corroboration. Although on February 27, 1948, four weeks after the assassination, Patel had written to Nehru of his conclusion based on what he called his, quote, almost daily touch with the progress of the investigation, quote, unquote, into the killings. That, quote, it was a fanatical wing of the Hindu Mahasabha directly under Savarkar that hatched the conspiracy and saw it through." Unquote. Patel's letter. Yeah. A later commission appointed by the government of India in 1966, headed by retired Supreme Court Justice Jeevan Lal Kapoor, gave its report in 1969, after three years of very detailed investigation, that Savarkar was in on the conspiracy. If the project of Hindu nationalism continues its present advance, some of its champions may not hesitate in times to come to assert that Savarkar was indeed involved in Gandhi's assassination. In December 92, when the Babri Mosque was illegally demolished by thousands before a stunned nation, many welcomed the demolition, but no one came forward to claim a role in it. A few months ago, however, as I mentioned, uh, a woman who was the BJP candidate for the Lok Sabha declared she was proud that she climbed the top one of the mosque's domes and helped demolish it. When the time is ripe, double speak can be abandoned. So let me make a few other points before I sit down. One, very few in the world are purely one thing. There is likely an element, small or large, of Hindu nationalism in Hindu admirers of Gandhi. And there is likely elements of Hin Gandhi's Hinduism in many Hindu nationalists. Two, a great many in India, many more than we think, are responding in ways they can to Hindu nationalism's dangers and errors. There is great courage, there is also great ingenuity in the <coughs> responses. This is also true for responses <coughs> elsewhere <coughs> to white nationalism, or to Hungarian nationalism, or Muslim nationalism, or whatever. Three, those of us who are troubled by nationalism surge may need to be a little nicer than we are to our allies in the battle. That an ally must agree with us on every point is a foolish demand, a recipe for failure. We come to this moment of concern, of crisis, from different places. Let us make allowances for one another. Let us appreciate one another. Finally, 
nationalism, nationalism surge will end. In my own lifetime, I have seen the departures of imperialism, apartheid, Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, to name some. Oppressions will end. Liberty and equality will again be honored. But as one of Gandhi's favorite lines puts it, we should not demand to see the distant sea. One step enough for me. No matter how small or simple, it is the next step that you and I should be searching for. If we find the next step, the rest will follow, including in the end, the restoration of the dream. Thank you. Questions, yes, starting with Bob, and then somebody I remember from the class, I thought, and then Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Rajmohanda, uh, for that very clear-eyed uh, and not entirely despairing <laughs> account of uh, the situation. I just was wondering, you know, with regard to your allusion to uh, the Prime Minister's uh, blatantly hypocritical uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times on Gandhi Jayanti, do you see that Gandhi now has become a kind of public relations export for India, outside to show how wonderful and Gandhi in India is, while internally you carry on the same things you described? Uh, there's kind of a split now in the representation of Gandhiji? So I think the, we are all familiar with this, that when a campaign like this is launched, uh, it's something like the Indo nationalist campaign. There are always two ways of conducting the campaign. Uh, one is to encourage the denunciation of other values like Gandhi's values. So India now sees a tremendous attempt all across India to openly attack Gandhi's values, Nehru's values, Ambedkar's values, India's values, I many would say. That, that goes on and is completely uh, unimpeded by anybody that the central government does. It goes on in, in textbooks, it goes on television, of course, in social media, other ways. But simultaneously, because Gandhi is a factor, an element of value in the world, why not use Gandhi to? Uh, so there's nothing surprising. We, 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 we have never seen consistency from <laughs> people like this. Anyway, in the history of, 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 of other uh, movements of, of this kind. So we should not be surprised by this double speak. Double speak is a well known thing. Uh, why it is indulgent is one thing, but the impact of double speak is hard to know. Now, one thing we can be sure of in India, many uh, devotees of Hindu nationalism are hopelessly confused by Narendra Modi all the time saying that Gandhi was fantastic. So while we recognize the strategy that they, these people have, even they do not have complete control of the impact of the strategy. Mm -hmm. This is my comment. Go ahead. Uh, um, so you mentioned that thank you for the talk. Just stand up, uh, sir. Uh, thank you for the talk, sir. Uh, my name is Shabam. Um, you mentioned that um, Sadar Patel concluded that uh, Savarkar was indeed behind guns at this nation. But uh, there seems to be some reason why the ruling party keeps invoking Sadar Patel along with Savarkar. Why do you think the ruling party retains the legacy of Sadar Patel? Uh, thank you for a good question. But the ruling party will do many things like that. No. Uh, they will certainly, when they are also trying to use Gandhi, uh, they have praised Indira Gandhi from time to time. They have even praised Jawaharlal Nehru from time to time. And Sardar Patel is a highly respected figure in many parts of India. He is also criticized by many. Uh, 
Uh, and since uh, it is an obvious line of present party, which they can abandon at any stage, uh, I'll tell you what the line is and why they may abandon it, which is to say that uh, if only Patel had become Prime Minister and not Nehru, mm -hmm. we would have been spared all this. There would have been no Nehru, there would have been no Indira Gandhi. So the idea is to build this narrative that yes, uh, Gandhi was a great man, but he made a very serious mistake in making sure that Nehru would become Prime Minister. But if only Patel had been the Prime Minister of India, we would not have had. So to, to demolish the image of Nehru and all his descendants is a central plan. So the uh, uh, adulation of Patel and the creation of the world's greatest statue and all that <laughs> is all part of the campaign to attack Nehru <coughs> and to attack anyone connected with Nehru. So that is why, why, why they do it. But there again, it may not always work in their favor. There are many who know what Patel did. There are a great many who know what Patel said. So what they're doing is, is understandable from their point of view, but if it will not necessarily gain them the success that they want, this is my take on it. I don't know whether it answers your question, no. but I think uh, both your question and the question before yours about what the internationalists are doing, whether it's with Gandhi or with Patel, those are important questions. But I think what we have to figure out now more is what our response can be. Uh, we don't like uh, what internationalists is, is doing. So what is the way of arresting is the question we must ask. Rather than, why is it that they're doing this? They're doing it because this is what they think will advance their cause. Okay? If we disagree with their goal and with their cause, our main concern should be, what can we do now to arrest this and, God willing, reverse this? Does this make sense? Osama? Yes. Uh, Thank you for that, the talk. Uh, just uh, an observation, minor observation on something you said that struck me, and then a question about what you did not allude to, perhaps, uh, was asking advice. Uh, on what you said, I was actually taken aback by the John McCain uh, story at the end of the vignette, because I would really caution you from using that, because of course McCain, as you know, was a, an unrepentant pilot who, who did what he did in Vietnam and never apologized for that. But more to the point, in that specific moment, he didn't tell the person, um, you shouldn't say that. He said, no man, no man, he's a good family man. In other words, it wasn't about, no, Obama is an Arab or a Muslim. That, it wasn't actually, so in other words, he was not exactly disputing the racist aspect. He was just saying that Obama is not like that. So I just think it's important, you know, it's important to keep that in mind because people may think that McCain is, was good in that moment. But then in terms of what you did not say, because I was truly inspired by the, by the jets of the talk and of course by everything you narrated uh, about this extraordinary struggle against racism in, in India and the dangers of this. But my question is, who do the RSS or the internationalists look to outside of India for inspiration? In other words, when they build this idea of a Hindu nationalism, do they look only at Savarkar and people inside of India or do they look outside for models? you know, around the world? Who are they looking to to build alliances with so that we can be aware of encountering that? Thank you for the, uh, both points. On your first point, I'll say this. That while I agree that McCain's answer was not entirely satisfactory, I would say that your point, question is a very good example of, of, of all of us deciding that we will not take support from some quarters no matter what, you know. Uh, if even McCain's 50% or 60% or 40% comment is of some value, which I think it was, and it still is. McCain still has many supporters, not only in Arizona, but in many other parts of the United States. If McCain too can be enlisted on our side, there's nothing wrong in it, purely from a strategic angle also, quite apart from anything else. Let us concede that McCain did many things that uh, distasteful to us. 
So that is my, so let us, let us not be so, anyway, point made. So, so on your other, other point about the, uh, the inspiration from uh, sources outside India for internationalism, is, this changes, depends on who is popular. So when Hitler was going strong, some of the people I've quoted spoke about Hitler's Germany as, as a wonderful example. In more recent years, they speak of Israel as a wonderful example. But then depending on how uh, the situation in the world changes, but as of now, now some. You know, they have tried to see whether Trump can be used or not used. I think they're not sure. <laughs> so at the, at the moment, uh, this is their, their predicament. Churchill, now many people, of course, will say that Churchill too had committed so many horrors, and he did. But Churchill did say some good things, some, some helpful things. He did say, if you are confronted with a great struggle, always think also of the problems that the enemy has. When Hitler sent his soldiers to Russia, Churchill spoke about General Mudd and General Ice are working for us. <laughs> so, uh, in a, and I think it's very important to see Hindu nationalism in a global context. Uh, and uh, they, are, they are certainly moving forward at the present time, but they're not necessarily having it all their own way. Uh, depending on what happens here in 2020, you know, that can also make a difference to the world. You know, right now, BJP or Hindutva forces are really espousing Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, okay? And the fact that a narrative is going around that it is actually so it nothing to do with Gandhi independence, but Bose and INA project. What is your take on it? I'm a Bengali, so that's not the part of it. <laughs> <laughs> is this a question about Subhash Chandra Bose and the INA? I see. It's similar to the other questions, you know, uh, uh, the Hindu, Hindu nationalists will use Gandhi. Hindu nationalists will use Gandhi. They will use Patel. They will use uh, Subhash Bose, of course, whoever that they can use. <coughs> but Subhash Bose's record is so plain. He was for Hindu Muslim partnership. So, uh, why should we be surprised and shocked? if Hindu nationalists try to use whatever they can to gain their ends. Why should we be surprised and shocked? And why should we enter the discussion at their level? Uh, did, was Gandhi always fair to Subhash Bose? His question asked. But the question today is, what were the essential beliefs of Subhash Bose? In what way are they different from Gandhi's beliefs? Subhash Bose wanted an independent India, united India, Hindu Muslims to be together. Fantastic. That's what Gandhi wanted. That is the only comment I would, ma I would make. So on all these, Patel likewise. Patel and Nehru had differences. Patel and Gandhi had differences. But what did Patel stand for? He wanted equality. He wanted the law to be observed. He wanted the RSS to be banned. So that is how I would answer. So why should we be surprised if the RSS or uh, Hindu nationalists want to use Netaji Subhash Bose as such an obvious thing that they would do? We should be surprised if they don't do it. So let us uh, explain, let us share our knowledge of the crucial ways, crucial areas where Subhash Bose and Gandhi were absolutely at one. This is this is my my response. Yes, Second yeah. part of my question yeah. is the narrative going around us for some reason is that that British left India, the big part of it is INA and Subhash Bose. What is your, uh, you know, I, I, I know my answer is I don't agree, but what is your, you know, this part of the same answer? No, of course, that the, uh, double speak I mentioned, they will use Gandhi where they can they will try to destroy Gandhi in other ways. And this is one way of, of weakening Gandhi by saying, oh, it was not his nonviolence, but Subhash Bose, INA, and the Japanese who... 
but then uh, they can't do that do that every every time because you know uh, the Japanese military power of Second World War is not always not everywhere loved greatly loved so they will be very selective in using that so and but you know today's discussion is Hindu nationalism and Gandhi's India not the degree to which India's independence was held by Subhash Bose. <laughs> that is a separate question. Yeah. It's, a question it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important question. Yes. Question about? Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question about what you said. The question that we asked is what should we do about the uh, yeah. nationalism? So it would be nice to know your thoughts on what should be done. Practically, so, and just a follow up would be that what are your thoughts on the fact that in Congress there are a lot of people with merit, but they are not able to come up because of the uh, dynasty politics. So like, no, uh, they are not able to come up that Gandhi name. No, not <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But this is the most important. And actually, I did indicate something. You know, once each one of us must find the next step for ourselves. I would say that today, <coughs> to defeat this, we not only need Gandhi's legacy, we need Solzhenitsyn's legacy. Uh, we need also uh, this man uh, in Germany. Uh, uh, Bonhoeffer, uh, Dietrich, what was his first name? Dietrich. Dietrich. Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, who wanted to meet Gandhi in 1934. He almost went to Gandhi to meet him, but he couldn't go. Then he, he fought against Hitler. He was executed. So people who courageously have stood up to totalitarianism of all kinds, left and right, uh, we have to study those if we are to deal with uh, mounting uh, nationalism of the world today. Now, one practical uh, suggestion I have is that Indian Americans in the United States, who are a very gifted, very resourceful, uh, often very well placed group, have a very great role. And one way in which they can increase their role is by deepening their links with African Americans with Latino, Latina Americans, with white Americans, with Chinese Americans, with Jewish Americans, with Muslim Ar Americans, Arab Americans. Here is a wonderful chance we have to build not just tactical coalitions, but genuine partnerships. If the uh, as I see it, the strategy of these ethno-nationalists all the world over is to say that every country, one particular group, has a natural right to rule. Whites in the United States, Hindus in India, and similar groups elsewhere. Okay. Uh, then everybody else, we have to see how we can unite. On the basis of equality, mutual respect, mutual friendship. And so this is where we, we, have, we need allies from all sides, but in particular, in particular, the power we will have if Indian Americans and African Americans can create a partnership will be tremendous. Uh, and there is basis for it. Uh, but it, it is, a, of course, something where we, we, we Indian Americans have to do much more than we have done so far. How many of us have, I'm not an Indian American, I'm an Indian in America. I, I have an Indian passport, but I completely uh, identify myself with Indians in America, even those who have US passports. How, ma how, how many of us have really studied the story of slavery in the United States? How many of you, if you're literature students, how many of us have studied Toni Morrison? Once we really enter into the lives of the African Americans, similarly, there are the other groups in America. I mentioned the, uh, the Latino and uh, Latino Americans, and there's so many other groups. Here we can meet other groups the way we can't in other, other parts of the world. So that is one way, so deepening our solidarity with, our partnership with, a genuine knowledge of one, you know, one simple truth which all of you are aware of, but this is a truth that I have learned not just by observation, but through my research for my history. Oops. Proximity does not ensure knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Knowledge has to be worked at. People, are, we have opinions about others, we don't have knowledge about others. We must create knowledge about our fellow Americans, our fellow humans, 
and, and, and local acts, local acts will have their impact globally. Mm -hmm. We can't create a, a global movement to defeat all this. Local movements in all our towns, all our small places, will ultimately have their impact on the world. Oh my goodness. Shivam, since you've already asked, I'm not going to call on you, okay? Uh, the gentleman back there. And I think we'll take two more questions and then take it outside. Vicky will ask. Yes? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. And um, I fear that this question might have some similarities with the one you just answered. But uh, I was once presented with the idea that global trends can often be found first in India, simply because it's such a large democracy. And my question for you is, do you think that in perhaps the same way that we can see the rise of nationalism in India and then globally, we can also see the downfall of nationalism in, Indi in India and then globally, and more particularly how? <laughs> um, so I think there is both truth and error in the notion that great things will happen through Indians or through India. Uh, I think Indians certainly have great uh, uh, role to play, and have played a role, and, but all other groups also have great roles to play. And one thing that I absolutely disagree with is that India is the Vishwa Guru. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher of the world, for those of you who didn't know what that is. <laughs> Vishwa Bandhu is okay. Vishwa <laughs> Friend of the world. Uh, Vish Vishwa Sevak is perhaps service. even better. And service of the world. Yeah. But to be true brothers and sisters to the world is, is one thing. And learning from you know, China, the African Americans, the Arab Americans, the Jewish Americans, the Irish Americans. There's so much that we have to learn from. And they also have so much to contribute to the story of the world. You know, when, uh, when Howard Furman, an African American, met Gandhi in 1936, Gandhi said to him, hitherto I thought that Indians would teach nonviolence to the world. Mm -hmm. Now I feel that African Americans will teach nonviolence to the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there'll be, so, so anyway, all, all groups, all nations, every individual has a role to play. So I think we can take two more questions and then we'll move it outside Which the gentleman sure. and white, and, and then I've got my eye on you, don't worry. Hi. Um, <coughs> I'd like to ask, to request you, if you could think of a book you wrote many years ago called Revenge and Reconciliation. It was very powerful for me to read that and to reflect on the violent tendencies that are prevalent in the Indian subcontinent throughout its history. Um, I was touched to hear you say towards the end that you know no person is entirely one thing. Um, I, in my opinion, one of the greatest dangers to India is the conviction of many of us Indians that we are fine, and if we just take care of that group, then we'd be okay. You know, if we took care of the <coughs> nationalists, we'd be fine. So I was wondering if you could just reflect on um, that book um, to come to bear on current situation. So I'm going to ask the last sure. question, and then give you a chance to okay. answer both of them. Go ahead. The last question. You. Yes, yes, I'm looking at you. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, um, so I was uh, just wondering, um, like how, again, like 1940s and like social movements were like, very powerful, and like now that we have the internet, they have a lot of potential to be spread much faster. And I'm wondering, what can, how can we? Uh, not only revive the power of social movements uh, in, in India back then um, to address the problems of India today, but also how to take advantage of what we have now to make them even more powerful. So thank you for these two great questions. So maybe I'll take yours first and then I'll answer it, please. Um, I think in your very question lies the germ of, of the possible answer. So those of us, and that excludes me, those of us who understand social media <laughs> and are comfortable with it, 
can also play a very great role. Without a doubt, just as it is possible for negative ideas to spread at great speed, it is certainly also possible for positive ideas also to spread. And already it is happening in so many ways. Wonderful ideas are being shared, money is being raised, <coughs> allies are being found, recruits are being raised. So that is a tremendous way in which, you know, to again, let us, uh, point I made about the co context in the world. Notion that one group should have supremacy against the notion that there should be equality, mutual friendship, and mutual respect. So I think the human beings all over the world, if given a chance, will really opt for the latter. Although anger and emotions and rumors can play the part of fear, can play a part of supporting the former. So if the artistic minds, I think this is where art, of course, plays even more than communication, great art has a role. Artists, poets, novelists, dramatists, Filmmakers, so those have a very, very great role to play, and that will happen and is happening. But I think we need not, we need not expect or even desire that some great movement will quickly take place that will defeat all this. <laughs> I think that is the temptation we have to avoid. We look for some great movement or some great individual. When our task is to do something more effective locally, where we are. That is bound to have an impact in the long run. And of course, fearless speech is essential. Where we can speak. Now in many countries, in Kashmir, total silence. Nobody can speak. But here we can speak. So if small groups even put out a statement about Kashmir, it will help. If small groups put out a stat statement about Hong Kong, it will help. So wherever there is injustice, and we are convinced of it, those of us who have the freedom to speak must, even at a local level, speak in the, in the faith, in the confidence that what we do, even at the local level, is bound to have an impact. This is mine. I, so there's no, e there's no easy answer. You know, uh, when Hitler was there or Stalin was there, the United States, not immediately, but at least afterwards, was willing to fight. Hitler, willing to fight Stalin. Uh, there were other countries too. Today, when there is this global ethno-nationalist trend, which country is committed to fighting it globally? None. So in some ways, there is no roadmap from history on what we should do. So all of us have to figure that out. On Vivek's, uh, thank you Vivek for uh, speaking about uh, revenge and reconciliation. A a and the key point that you, that each of us, I think for Indians particularly, I think I'm so glad you make this point. I think this is perhaps the most important point for Indians particularly. That our self image of great goodness and great wisdom, that self image needs iconoclasts. <laughs> That self-image is so false. We know it to be false. <laughs> we know there has been so much violence, so much cruelty. But our smugness, our self-satisfaction with our goodness, with our wisdom, you know, one should not, you know, if my daughter were here, she'd say, ah, you're again generalizing. This is reductionism. This is this, that, and the other. <laughs> but I think, Yes, other groups may also have that weakness. I'm not saying Indians only have that weakness, but we Indians have a good case of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vivek. Before we go, um, there's a gentleman who wishes to make an announcement, and then I will. Thank uh, you. Hi, I'll invite uh, you. My name is Raji Raji Gopal. Uh, I think uh, the professor talked about forming alliances, working with other groups where we can locally. In that spirit, a group of us have started a group called Hindus for Human Rights. It is a US-based organization where we want to continue this dialogue at a local and at a national level and work with our partners in, in India. So we're very glad that we started this discussion with, uh, uh, with Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi. And uh, thank, thanks to the Institute and the moderator for having a great discussion. 
We are partnering as part of our initial partnership. We are partnering for, with Indians, Indian American Muslim Council, and we have the, their representative here. And we want to use this center and a lot more to continue along the lines that you talked about, <coughs> continue the dialogue. That's the theme that we want to follow. Thank you.